We are recording now. Welcome to session six in our UL System Financial Wellness Series for 2023. Uh, I'm Brian Bolton. I'm a finance professor at UL Lafayette. And for 2022 and 2023, I'm serving as the content expert on financial literacy for the UL system. Uh, the UL system has five content experts across different disciplines, and each of us are putting on a series of either workshops, presentations, podcasts, different, different, uh, different resources and engagement with our system colleagues. The other four, see if I can do this, mental health, research and grants, online learning, and open access education. So feel free to check out their sessions if you're interested. This is session six in my financial wellness series. Today's topic is sending your loved ones off to college. Again, I'm Brian Bolton. Please feel free to reach out to me, brian.bolton at louisiana.edu is my email. I have a website that's kind of a library or a repository of workshops, slide decks like this one. There are uh, three personal finance books posted on there for you to download, some other resources. That address is uh, business.louisiana.edu slash finances personal. I chose that, uh, that address in part because uh, that's my belief. Finance is personal. Finance is very personal. And what we're going to talk about today is, is certainly personal. It's different for everyone. It's your situation, your goals, your values, your resources, your relationships, your people will determine kind of the decisions you, you make and the best financial practices. I can't tell you here are the 10 things you have to do from a finance perspective. What I'll do today is give some, some general ideas and general guidelines. They may or may not be best for you, your family and your situation because finance is personal. That's all the more reason to write down my email address and reach out to me later if you ever wanna go through your personal situation kind of one-on-one. -on -one and talk about your what may be best for your situation. As I mentioned, this is session six in our, my 15 part series. We're over here, middle left, financial planning, sending loved ones off to college. We've got another session tomorrow on kind of the other end of the life cycle spectrum of caring for adult dependents and um, how you can manage uh, your financial situation with maybe two or three other generations uh, along with your priorities. Then we'll take uh, about a 10 or I guess a two week, 12 day break, um, celebrate July 4th. Um, and then we'll pick back up in a couple of weeks with uh, kind of career planning, which is maybe one of my favorite topics in, in all of this um, financial planning because it's um, there's so much kind of opportunity and anxiety that maybe comes along with changing careers. And so we'll talk about the financial and personal issues. And then we'll continue. The rest of the sessions, uh, with the exception of the July 18th and 19th sessions, all sessions are at noon. Those sessions will be at 3 p.m. Central Time. And so we've got this 15 session series. We are in the middle of kind of a six part series on the family. While all financial planning is about you, about the family, your people, your um, your family members, we have five or probably six of the 15 that are maybe a little more exclusive to, to family. Um, and here we are in the middle left, talking about sending, uh, sending our loved ones off to college. Um, and I'll, let me put a caveat. When I say loved ones, in theory, we mean anyone and everything. So it could be, could be a spouse, could be a sibling, could be friends, could be parents. The, the language I'm using kind of throughout this, this presentation will be children or kids, um, in part because with children and kids, maybe that's the most common loved one scenario that we're sending off to college, but also it gives us kind of a, the longest ramp, the longest time horizon to plan, to build a financial plan and to kind of have ownership and involvement with the financial plan and the, the process. But again, finance is personal. Your loved one situation, um, sending them off to college may be different than you know traditional, traditional children. Um, and so hopefully the advice, much of the advice still applies to you, but obviously adapt it to your, to your situation. As I mentioned, tomorrow we'll talk about uh, 
adult, adult dependents, kind of the other end of the, the life cycle. Talk about building savings accounts and emergency funds, which, which could apply, which does apply to everyone. Um, but uh, we'll look at it kind of from a family perspective a little bit. Look at when uh, you or the financial planner is getting close to retirement, but not necessarily at retirement. And then one of the last sessions we'll do is thinking about the fun stuff. Um, rather than just willpower, diligence, and responsibility, let's have some fun with our financial planning and think about how we can build that in to what we're doing too. Every financial plan begins with values, dreams, and goals. Up at the top in the blue, think about what are, what are values, dreams, goals from an educational perspective, career perspective, family perspective. We're going to focus on the family today. When we do that, we always want to start with our current situation. Where are we? Current situation is point A, values, dreams, and goals are point B. The financial plan in red, those items, that's how we get from point A to point B. That's how we achieve our values, dreams, and goals from our current situation. Today, we're talking about the family. We're talking about the family impacts, kind of everything else, um, and kind of specifically the investment in education. I'm a finance professor. I've been one for over 20 years. I'm very much biased. I believe college education is the best investment we can make you, as, as parents, as, as society. So I'm very much biased in kind of the returns and benefits of this investment, but it is costly. We it is a large investment, both in terms of time, energy, focus, relationships, and of course, money. Uh, most of what we talk about today will be the investment of money in part because finance is personal and I don't be made by being appropriate for me to make assumptions or get into many of those um, kind of more personal abstract issues that are non-financial, um, or at least in the short term. We'll talk about some opportunity costs of working and college and so forth. But um, I, you know, my bias is that college education is the best investment you can make in thinking about creating a financial plan to build from there. So that's where we're going. As we're building these financial plans, we talked about in a session last week for the family, we want to build financial plans for everyone. So it's not just the family as one whole unit. It's yes, we've got a family financial plan, but then we should be building, designing financial plans for each member of the family. And obviously, you know, 40 year old parents, your financial plan is going to be more involved and complex than maybe an eight year old son or daughters might be. But as that eight year old becomes 12, 15, 18, now we've got more, more parts involved. And certainly we've got the education part, we've got budgeting, investing, maybe taxes, maybe, maybe debt management as well. And so uh, strongly encourage everyone to build individual, customized, personalized financial plans for every member of the family, kind of within the context of one big family financial plan. So the way I've done this, kind of preparing to send our loved ones off to college, um, again, my focus is on children or kids. Um, and I've got four time frames. kind of, uh, we're six, eight years away from college. I mean, again, my, my assumption is children that are going to college basically at 18 years old, 17, 18, 19 years old, so we'll start with kind of 12 years old and younger when we have a lot of time to plan. When they get to middle school, 12 to 15 years old, we still have time, but now it's becoming more tangible and realistic. And then when the kids are in high school, 15 to 18 years old, and we start making plans for college, we start thinking about paying for college, we start thinking about borrowing. And then finally, we'll talk about kids are going off to college. So in my mind, if Kids go to school in August, start college in August. That last section is kind of that calendar year, January to December of going off to college. Maybe it's longer, maybe it's less. Um, but uh, those are the, the four time frames that I'm thinking about, that I'll talk about. And so let's get started with 12 years old and younger. The biggest and best investment you can make is to open a 5.9 education savings account. And then once you have it open, begin contributing and investing within it. A lot of people open the account and don't fund it, which is, it's nice to have the option, but you at least wanna, you wanna use it. I know sometimes it's difficult to find the money to put into it, but 
five dollars here, ten dollars there, the more you can put in, especially when the children are very young. If if the children are zero, right, just newborns, you have 18 years to let money work for yourself and for your children. Uh, and time in investing time is usually your best friend. So be sure to, to invest in it. And when I say invest, think about taking some risks, not huge risks, but some risks. Current inflation rate right now is 4%. It's been 5% a month or two ago. It was 9% a year ago. Here in July, June, July 2023, it's about 4%. Whatever the current normal inflation rate is, you can expect the education infl inflation rate to be one, two, three percent higher than that. Um, a lot of reasons why we're not going to go into that now, but historically, it's kind of the past 20, 30 years, it's been a fact that the cost of higher education, I say education on the slide, the cost of higher education have generally increased one or two, three percent more than the actual inflation rate. And so we can prepare for that. The reason the 5.9 is a great tool to help you prepare is it allows us to invest tax free. So if you put money into your bank savings account, you're going to get maybe two or three percent. Maybe some banks are still paying one percent. If you move it into a CD or certificate deposit, you can find rates of four to five percent, which is basically in line with inflation, but still less than the education inflation. So if you're thinking you need to save twenty thousand dollars for your children's twenty thousand dollars in today's dollars for your children's education, by the time they become eighteen and you're paying, it might be twenty five or thirty because of the education inflation rate. And so we want to try to invest today to keep up with that. The way to do that is to take some risks in the stock market or other diversified securities. If we look back over the past 100 years, the stock market has averaged 12% per year return. Some years are good, some years are bad. 2021 was great, 2022 was bad. And the reason I mention this in the 12 years old and younger is because over time, the average is 12%. And if you have six, seven, eight years to plan for your children's education, what happened in 2022, that negative 20% return will get washed out or you know, um, covered by the, by the higher returns in other years. So if my children were 12 years old, I would have no problem investing in the S&P 500. I'll show that in just a second. If my children were 16 years old, I might have a problem with this. So as the children get closer to college and as they get older and you have less time to correct for years like 2022, then maybe you want to be less aggressive, less risky. Uh, so far in 2023, the stock market's up about 10%. So 21, we're up 25, 22, we're down 20, now we're up 10. Who knows what it'll do the rest of the year? But if you have six plus years looking for higher returns, returns that are higher than the education inflation rate. That's what we want to do, which will effectively make the cost of education go down relative to today. So 5.9 education savings account, I call this the platinum of all financial planning tools. Why is that? The benefits, all gains earned in the account are tax-free if they're used for education. So if you deposit 2,000 and it grows to 5,000, that $3,000 gain is tax-free if the full 5,000 is used for education. No other tool that we have in investing or financial planning gives you such tax-free benefits. Retirement plans kind of do, but you have to pay taxes at least initially. Um, so money in the account can be transferred to anyone else, which is great. One of the concerns about the, the credits, the state level credits that we had you know, 20 years ago was you use it or lose it. With a 529, it's not really use it or lose it because you can, you know, if you save 20,000, you only use 15, that additional five can be transferred to another child or to yourself or for whatever other education needs you have. So, um, or if the child doesn't go to college, you can transfer the full amount. It's not just for college. It can be used for primary and secondary school expenses. It can be used for junior college. It can be used for trade school, beauty school, 
whatever educational purposes you or your child have. So when I say it can be invested in just about anything you want, qualified education expenses is, the, is going to be the key term. And generally qualified education expenses are those expenses that are unique to education, such as tuition, fees, um, a computer, books, fees. Room and board usually is not included as a qualified education expense because the assumption is most of us need food and a place to live regardless of whether we're in school. We don't necessarily need to live in a dormitory and have a meal plan, but that's a choice according to the IRS. And according to the IRS, that is not a qualified education expense. But still, we have tons of flexibility within a 529 savings account. The transferability, the two big ones are the transferability and the tax-free. Money grows tax-free. So if it grows from two to 5,000, you don't have to worry about taxes in the 5,000 so long as it's used for education. The drawback, um, even though I said it's, it's not really use it or lose it, it kind of is, right? It's, it's designed or dedicated for education purposes. You can't take money out of the 529 to go buy a new car or even a car for your child going off to college because the child's going to need a, a car regardless of what they're in college. The car is not exclusive to, to college. So um, it's kind of use it or lose it or use it for this purpose or use it, lose it. If you withdraw the money for non-education purposes, you will pay taxes. So you pay taxes on the money growing from 2000 to 5000 You'll pay money on that $3,000 gain. So 20% of that, six or $700 probably, plus a 10% penalty. And the penalties, you know, the punitive part. Um, to me, it's worth the risk. I don't know that I would have 100% of my college planning in a 529 because of that risk. I would have most of my, my college planning money in a 529 because of that tax freeness. And especially you, if you have more than one child that you think you're going to college, maybe you put 30,000 in the first child's account, 20,000 in the second, 10 in the third, because you know you can kind of keep transferring it down to each child. It might look a little bit unfair and the third child might complain so long as you have a conversation with them about what you're doing. Maybe something like that um, makes a lot of sense. You kind of hedge the risks. So the drawback is that quasi user to lose it, but the, to me, the benefits are far outweigh those risks. So what would I do? What, what would an investment plan look like? Certainly at 12 years old or younger, I would, put, I would be aggressive. I would put 80 to 90% of my college fund money into a 529 um, and keep the other 10 or 20%, maybe in cash, maybe in bonds, in a taxable account because of that user lose it. Within the 529, I might invest at least half, maybe 60 or 70% into the S&P 500 index. So the ticker symbol SPY is a good, there's a, there's a bunch of different ways to invest in the S&P 500 index. The easiest to me is SPY. Uh, it's just a mutual fund or an index fund that tracks the S&P 500. The 12% annual return that I told you about five minutes ago, that's for the S&P 500. Yes, there's risk. We can have another year like 2022 where the market loses 20%. But if history is any judge or any guide, over the last 100 years, we've always recovered. And no five-year period outside of the 1929 to 1933 period has been negative. And so if you can plan for five years or more, the risks of you losing money over a five-year period by taking moderate risks with the S&P 500, the chances of you losing money historically have been close to zero. I can't promise that's what the future is going to be. Uh, I'd be willing to make that bet. And um, you need to figure out if you're willing to make that bet too. But again, the goal is to keep up with education inflation. That's five, six, seven, eight percent. So I put 60 to 70 percent in moderately aggressive S&P 500 index. As I mentioned last week, I love the idea of involving children in, in investing decisions. I might put another 15 or 20 percent into select investments, possibly of the child's choice. Involve the child in this in this choice. Pick stocks, maybe pick real estate, whatever the child may be interested in. 
get them engaged and get involved. And so you might end up having 80% of your 529, 80% or more, invested in moderately high risk stocks. That may be too much risk for you. So maybe you want to dial that back to maybe 50 or 60%. But again, as long as you have five or six years until college, till you need the money, you can afford to lose money in a year or two if you rely on history to be your, your guide that historically all losses have been uh, made up for eventually in a relatively short period of time. And then I might put another 15 or 20% in low risk cash accounts, whether that's CDs within the 529, bonds, or money market cash account within the 529. When the child is maybe five or six years old, you can take a lot of risks. Once the child gets maybe closer to 12, 13, you can take, I would recommend taking less risk just because the possibility of recovering from a 20% loss becomes smaller. But once you open the 529, the, the key way to, to keep up with inflation is to take some moderate once the kids are 12 to 15 years old, I would, I'd rotate some investments into lower risk assets, sell some of our high growth stocks that we had at maybe age 12, move to maybe 50% instead of 70% by, by 15. I'm a big fan of making sure the child has their own savings and checking account. Uh, they may not have a lot of income. They might not have a lot of money, maybe from birthdays, maybe from chores, maybe from mowing lawn, babysitting and others. This 12 to 15 year old period. But just having the accounts open gives you the option of either putting money into it or teaching responsibility. At some point, maybe not at 12, but probably closer to 15, I'd encourage opening a credit card in the child's name. If you have a credit card, you can probably add on another user. You can, should be able to easily add on another user. You can put the card in the child's name and that's such that it's co-signed by you. That's different than just adding on another user because if you're adding on another user, it's 100% yours. If you co-sign, then it's in both of your names. What that does is it builds a, a credit history for the child. If it's just another user on your account, that doesn't help the child's credit history at all. And you can put some, some regulations on your credit card. You can put some restraints. You can have a $200 limit. You can have the conversation with your child. This is just for emergencies or groceries or gasoline, whatever. You can have that conversation, but building responsibility, building behavior, and building a credit score are the big benefits. During this middle school into high school period, begin researching scholarships. A lot of families, a lot of parents don't think of scholarships. They may not think their child is, uh, is elite enough, if that's the, the preconception, um, for scholarships. There are loads of scholarships at every college. And there are plenty of, there are a number of scholarships that do not get used because nobody applies. So you can begin researching scholarships, either big national scholarships or, or, or scholarships that are specific to the college. If this is your first child going off to college, begin the financial aid process, beginning, begin getting familiar with that. Um, you don't need to apply, you don't need to do anything. But also, but getting familiar with the financial aid process so it's not a shock when you're seven, your child is 17 and you are applying. And begin thinking about the full cost of college. Yes, tuition is the headline number, but there's so much more that goes into it. We'll look at this in a couple of slides. And I'm a huge fan of transparency in financial conversations with family members. Um, I want my children involved in these, in these conversations so they understand what I'm gonna do, they understand what I'm asking them to do. And we kind of have just this mature mutual agreement or mutual understanding about what the financial relationship is going into college and beyond. So 12, 12 to 15 years, um, nothing to really do, just begin kind of the, the research and the process. As the kids get into high school, I take my investment assets um, towards maybe 20 or 30% in higher risk talks. Once they're 16, 17, you cannot afford to lose 20% like we did in 2022. But if you lose 20% within a 20 or 30% bracket, it's not as painful while you're still keeping up, keeping alive the option of maybe that plus 25% that we got in 2021. And then I move a lot of the, re the rest of the money into cash. Keep in mind, you don't pay for 100% of college 
on the first day of freshman year, right? You're going to, some of the money that you have in your 529 plan, you're going to use when your child is 18, some you're going to use when they're 21, 22. And so you probably want to keep some aggressive investments, moderately aggressive investments within the 529 for junior and senior year uh, to benefit from growth up until junior and senior year. Again, scholarships, there's a lot of them. You can begin either applying or researching as early as sophomore, junior year in high school. Um, some you might, you'll have to wait until you're on campus, but there are a lot of them out there. And then if certainly if it's your first child, get familiar with the free application for federal student aid. There's been a lot of talk about student loans over the past 12 months since the Department of Education proposed forgiveness last August. Um, and a lot of people have been surprised by their own financial aid student loan status as a result of those conversations. Or as a result of those conversations, they began looking into their status. And many students and parents have been surprised by kind of what they had and what their obligations are. There are a lot of different types of student loans. Subsidized federal aid is the best. Subsidized means both has lowest interest rates and it's going to give you um, deferment on paying interest until after you're done with college. But not every family will apply, will, will, um, will qualify for federal student aid. There's a number that the Department of Education looks at. It's called the EFC, the Expected Family Contribution. And if your expected family contribution based on income and assets of the family is really high, then you're going to be eligible for less federal student loans. If you still, even though you on paper you have a high expected family contribution, if you still need a lot more money to pay for college and you can't get federal subsidized loans, you might have to go to private loans. And private loans are going to have higher interest rates and worse terms. You want to avoid private student loans if possible. If it's your only source, your only resource, then it's probably better than nothing, but you want to avoid private loans in lieu of federal subsidized loans if at all possible. And I, I recommend doing this, kind of getting familiar with FAFSA when the children are 15 years old, not just when they're 18, because if your expected family contribution is high, pardon me, pardon me if your expected family contribution, yeah, yeah, expected family contribution is high, which means you're not gonna be eligible for much aid. You can move some money around potentially, maybe get some money out of your name, put it into a trust, give it to you know, another family member, put it into other 529 plans for other children. There can be some things you can kind of rearrange your money at your assets at fifth, when your child is 15 that you can't do when they're 18 or it's too late to do when they're 18. And so you can use the high school years to modify or manipulate your um, financial assets to end up with more student, federal subsidized student loans uh, when the time comes. And also the free application for financial student aid is not the simplest, most obvious form in the world. A lot of people, a lot of really smart people struggle with filling it out properly. If you get familiar with it, kind of freshman, sophomore, junior year of high school, when it comes time to actually fill it out for real, it, uh, you'll be comfortable, more comfortable knowing what you're doing. Again, make sure each child has their own checking and savings account. Make sure each child has a credit card in their name. Um, again, I, I would, I'm a fan of keeping things co-signed probably through college. If you want a formal financial independence when they go off to college, great. But uh, if you're comfortable with your, your, your child's kind of financial behavior, um, you can keep it co-signed kind of through college to provide maximum benefit to, to the child, to the student. Um, and then as you, you know, during high school, begin researching what college is gonna cost. Um, we, universities, we advertise tuition. We're, we're really transparent about what tuition is. But even then, it may be a little confusing. Um, what is a full-time student? Is four classes the same as five classes? Do you pay by the credit hour? Or do you pay by the, the, the status, full-time, part-time? 
um, every campus is going to be a little different. And so under, even though tuition is transparent, it's not one price fits all. And so make sure you understand what the tuition cost is going to be. Room and board, there's a lot of questions to ask there. Um, if the child lives at home, maybe is, is a common option here in Louisiana. The financial benefits can be huge. The social costs of you know, social and academic and financial independence, but there may, there may be social costs that uh, the child is anxious to become independent. So we have to trade off those. Will the child live on campus if they don't live at home? Living on campus may be required for many first year students or, or longer at some colleges. Um, maybe, maybe the easiest, because you've, uh, you've got housekeeping, you've got uh, the cafeteria downstairs, you've got a resident assistant keeping you in line, but maybe it's less fulfilling. Um, again, many first and second year students will live on campus and then move to an off-campus apartment. Um, every college bill is going to have lots of fees. You'll be able to figure out some of this before enrollment, some you won't figure out until after. Um, for better or for worse, right or wrong, universities, we don't have a lot of flexibility in what we do with tuition. That may be, you know, certainly for public universities is that may be set by the state. Each campus has a little more flexibility with technology costs, uh, you know, lab costs, online costs, printing costs, and all these other fees that we can add on kind of an a la carte basis that have, don't have to go through the state legislature. Try to figure out the fees, ask other students, ask advisors, do what you can. And then begin making a budget for everything else, computer, software, books, other tools, resources, um, lab materials, whatever. Will the child need a car? If the child didn't have a car, a car in high school, will they need one at college, right? That could be a very expensive, especially if you add on insurance. And then it's not just about the cost, can the child make any money while they're on campus? Can they become a resident assistant and get either free room and board or some other stipend? There are lots of work study positions. There are a lot of assistantships, certainly for graduate students. There are lots of moderately relative, easy ways for children, for the students to earn money working pretty low intensity jobs on campus for 10, 15 hours a week. Um, and many times these also allow the students to establish relationships with faculty and staff on campus, which will have long-term benefits uh, in other ways. So high school is the prime time to begin thinking about it and begin budgeting. Once we figure out what the, what the child is gonna be doing, begin making that budget, involve the child in the budget, look at all the costs. These are gonna change, the numbers are gonna be wrong, everything is gonna be different. But if you make the budget, then you can have open and honest conversations with the child about what's required. And um, especially if the child is going to be expected to contribute to the cost of college in different ways. The child might want to know, should they be working while in college? Should they take four classes instead of five to allow for a work schedule or whatever? And so balancing kind of all these financial issues with personal, social, adult issues, uh, conversation and budgeting can help make that happen. So begin budgeting in high school, sit down, talk about the budgets with the children, involve them. Uh, maybe you don't want to be 100% transparent about your financial resources and how we're paying for college. But if you want the child to be financially independent, ultimately, College is the biggest investment they will make most of their lives, the biggest financial investment until they buy a house. Involving them is a great opportunity to get a shared understanding of uh, responsibilities and opportunities within this journey. So the kids are off to college. Here's three things I, I mean, there's a lot of different things we can do. Everything we've talked about so far, let's keep doing that. Three things I would highlight, keep every receipt. Explain why on the next slide. Keep having these conversations with the child. Make sure there's continued shared understanding. And check up on insurance. Uh, once the child leaves the nest, then insurance issues may or may not change, but we want to stay on top of them. Why do we want to keep every receipt? Because there are lots of IRS legitimate tax credits and deductions that you can apply um, to your education expenses. So 
Um, keeping receipts is the best way to claim these benefits. We don't necessarily want to keep a, you don't have to keep the receipts from your family vacation at Disney World, but if you buy a new computer senior year of high school, that may be a college dedicated qualified expense. And so begin keeping receipts, certainly once the child goes off to college, keeping the receipts. Two main tax credits are the American Opportunity Credit, which is the biggest. It's up to $2,500 per student, but it's only for the first four years after high school. Um, it's 25% of the first $10,000 will be credited. So that's pretty generous, pretty good. The Lifetime Learning Credit is less generous with money, but more generous with time. It's 2,000 per family instead of 2,500 per student for all years after high school. So what we see a lot of families do is use the American Opportunity Credit for their undergrad students, for each of their undergraduate students. And then once the, the children are in grad school, begin applying for the Lifetime Learning Credit, uh, which has you know, a smaller dollar amount, but you can't use the American Opportunity Credit for grad school in most cases. Qualified education expenses, we talked about these earlier. Tuition, computer, software, lab fees, but not room and board and not transportation because you are gonna have those whether you're in college or school or not. Keep every receipt, maximize your tax deductions and credits from this investment. Have the, keep having the conversations. We want the child to become financially responsible, financially independent. Make sure they know what they're covering, what you're covering. And over the past year, I've been maybe a little saddened, I guess, um, to see students surprised by their financial aid obligations. Um, again, with the forgiveness talks, people are checking their financial aid obligations or responsibilities. And a lot of students had no clue what they were doing. A lot of students had no clue what they signed up for when they were 17 or 18. And maybe they wouldn't have made choices differently, but certainly you know, if you've been undergrad and then grad school, you're 24, 25, and you're just now figuring out what your obligations are, that can be quite a shock. So make sure the child is understand, is, understands that repayment process and obligation, even though that might be four, five, six years away. Make sure they just are familiar that, hey, this is not free money. We borrowed this, we have to repay it whatever we means. If you do this for your first child, it'll become easier and better with each subsequent child. Uh, you'll become more expert. They will understand a little more uh, openly, and, but never ever stop communicating, having these conversations with your children about paying for college and funding this experience. And make sure your child has appropriate insurance. Um, healthcare, liability, renters, or dorm insurance, most undergraduate students will be able to stay on your family health care plan if you wish, if they wish, um, until they are 26. I have a lot of graduate students who, you know, mid 20s, they're no longer on the parents' uh, health insurance plan. It's quite a shock how expensive it is and that they now have to be responsible for it. If your students are, if your children are going to live on campus, they are probably still covered by your homeowner's liability insurance coverage. They are still technically living at home, according to the insurance company. They live at home, but then go to school and temporarily live in the dorm. So they're still covered by your homeowner's insurance. But they may not want to be. They may want their own renter's policy because the deductible is going to be lower and that you can customize the terms to really fit what the needs are. Renter's insurance within a dorm might be $10 to $15 a month. Rares insurance, insurance in an apart, off-campus apartment might be $20, $25 a month for most students. For most students, the, the laptop um, is the most irreplaceable item. You know, some people may think uh, what, clothes and jewelry, um, they're valuable. To me, the finance, the, the, the academic, they're less essential for, for education. Maybe I'm biased because I'm used to working with grad students who have their whole life on their laptop. And, and maybe not much of a, a life outside of that. Um, but you know, think about whether you want to get renter's insurance. Think about if you just want dorm insurance. Dorm insurance just covers the physical property, whereas renter's insurance covers property plus liability. 
It will have a slightly, dorm insurance will have even, an even lower deductible and can be a great option uh, for many students without a lot of stuff. And um, it gives them kind of the lowest cost option uh, to protect their stuff. But again, they may be covered by your homeowner's policy. Um, the downside of that is maybe you have a 500 or $1,000 deductible uh, that maybe you don't want to use when someone steals your child's shoes out of their dorm room. And then obviously make sure all vehicle coverage is sufficient. Um, many, many, many people start driving a lot more when they go to college, maybe because they're making trips back and forth to home. So just make, excuse me, make sure that they've got adequate coverage there. Beyond that, just keep doing everything else we've been doing um, and stay on top of the budgets, stay on top of um, you know, the conversations. Begin thinking about graduate school. Sometimes college students know their graduate school plan, plans from the time they're 17 or 18. Many of my juniors and seniors have no clue what their graduate school plans are. But if you begin thinking about them, you can kind of begin thinking about both the benefits and the, the costs, the cost in terms of money and time. Begin thinking about financial aid repayment. In general, with subsidized financial, federal financial aid, you begin repaying your student loans six months after you stop being a full-time student or even, you know, you know, yeah, yeah. And so um, that's usually, you know, six months after graduation, if you, um, you go straight through. So understand when it begins and between you and your child, make sure you're understanding who's responsible for repaying the student loans. Um, and then overall, begin thinking about financial independence for your child. If you're still co-signing the credit card, begin thinking about when you stop doing that. Begin thinking about um, when you stop covering their insurance, healthcare. Maybe it's you know a no-brainer to keep going until they're 26 and get kicked off, but maybe you don't want them on your homeowner's policy, or maybe you don't want cover it, to cover their vehicle auto insurance um, beyond college as well. So make those decisions and have those conversations. And then one of my favorite pieces of advice, um, I've known a number of uh, families who've given their children Roth IRA accounts you know, for Christmas or birthday during junior and senior year of college. Love it. It's a great way to help them begin thinking about careers and lives and ultimately retirement that might be 40 or 50 years away, but begin thinking about the benefits of planning for that, um, even when you're 19, 20. Um, for most college students, graduate students, the Roth IRA is going to be preferable because it has bigger tax benefits than an individual retirement account, but you probably can't go wrong with either. Um, getting your children a retirement account when they're 20, they're probably not gonna prioritize it on their own, but if you get them started, uh, eventually they'll, pretty quickly, they'll see the benefits. Again, as I said earlier, with investing, time is your best friend. Start it early, and let time and compound growth become your friend. But don't forget about yourself. It's not just about the kids, it's about you and your empty nest or your almost empty nest. Um, I got three comments, I guess. Um, if you have other children at home, obviously the nest won't be empty for years, but keep this process going with them. A lot of parents wanna treat their children equally, but if you made mistakes with the first one or two, you maybe don't wanna subject your second and third, fourth children to those same mistakes. What do I mean by mistakes? Maybe not applying for financial aid early enough. Maybe not getting enough financial aid. Maybe choosing the wrong financial aid. Maybe not applying for scholarships. Um, you know, maybe not getting your your, your child the, the cosign on the credit card. Whatever. Learn from mistakes. Move on and do better. Um, if if you made any mistakes, right? You don't want to make the same mistakes equally. But uh, learn from the process. The first time you send a child to, to college, you're both going to learn a ton about the process and about the money. Learn from that and apply it to, to help other children. And then, you know, once the nest is empty or once the nest is close to empty, begin thinking about you. Reprioritize you. For most of the past 18 plus years, I'm guessing your number one financial goal has been paying for college. Maybe buying a new house, maybe retirement. You've got other goals. But paying for college has been near the top of the list. Once you've got that done, once you've got that 
either transitioned or under control, review your financial plan. Be honest about your goals. Be honest about your assets and your, your situation. Begin, begin thinking about what you and your whole family need going forward. Maybe you want to buy your college graduate a car or a house or pay for the wedding. Great. But now that college, paying for college is no longer one of your top goals, you now have flexibility. So review your financial plan as a family, begin making kind of other goals and resetting if necessary, right? You, necessary to a certain extent because you don't no longer have college as the priority. And certainly if you've made any financial sacrifices, whether that's getting a second mortgage or taking a personal loan or borrowing against a retirement plan, begin the process of reconciling, you know, either repaying loans or re refinancing the mortgage, whatever. So you can kind of move out of this phase and move back to making your financial plan your number one priority. Again, tomorrow on uh, June 28th, we'll talk about taking care of adult dependents. But uh, once you get the children off to college, hopefully you've got a little bit of a gap to really focus on you and yourself. A few closing comments. We've talked about this. Involve the child as much as possible. Financial independence begins with financial engagement. Um, you don't want to start teaching financial independence when the child is 20 or 25. They, they're smart. They can learn when they're 10, 12, 14, different bits and pieces, right? Um, and begin preparing them for ultimate financial independence when and if that happens. Gap years, maybe they had a little bit of a stigma over time. Um, as someone who teaches 18, 19, 20 year olds, and I've been teaching for almost 25 years, I've, I've grown to become a huge fan of gap years for, for, certain, um, for cer certain situations and certain students. We want our, students, our children to stay on track, this, college, this high school plus four, plus grad school, whatever, but sometimes that's not best for the student. And certainly with the COVID-19 pandemic and classes at home or maybe homeschooling or chaos, turbulence, transition, whatever you want to call it, different 18 year olds are in different places. Different 18 year olds are maturing kind of academically, intellectually, socially at different times and different speeds. If you can find a productive gap year, whether that's work or internship or volunteering or whatever that allows, some, does something productive and allows your child to, to adjust academically, intellectually, socially, um, there can be huge gains from that. You know, it's, it's, there are, I see a lot of 18, 19 year olds who probably are not ready for college and you, you force into this, this path or this timeline and some students aren't ready and they don't maximize the benefit. I've grown to become a big fan of the gap year. It's not going to be for everyone, but there are a lot of people um, who really can begin, begin ben, can be, be benefit from it. As I said earlier, never stop looking for scholarships, work study. Every campus has lots of scholarships. Some seem hidden, maybe hidden within departments or even within majors or topics. They're not, not all advertised well. Talk to faculty, talk to department chairs, and you can probably find some hidden and specialized scholarships. Scholarships, the specialized might be by degree, by project, by demographic, and not all everyone applies for them. I've been on scholarship review committees where we had one applicant. And so long as that person meets the criteria, whatever the criteria may be, they get the scholarship. Not all scholarships are for the elite. Like that example, if you apply, uh, you might get it. And so never stop looking. And scholarships are generally, generally just free money. Um, there's no strings attached, no repayment. It's just free money taken off the tuition. Planning and pre preparing for college is a never ending process. It starts maybe as soon as the child is born, it ends maybe 25, 30 years later when grad school is done. Set our goals, figure out reality, see what we can do, what we, what we are trying to achieve. Create a plan, try to execute the plan, and then adjust your plan for how we get off plan or how the situation changes or inflation goes back to nine or 10%, you may need to adjust. But this is a never ending process. And so we wanna make our plans early and stay on top of it. We're trying to achieve happiness. It's a balance of short-term and long-term goals. For, for 18 years, going to college is a long-term goal. 
and then it becomes a reality of very short, lots and lots of little short-term goals. Trying to balance this against family needs, financial needs, and ultimately trying to give your child the best college experience possible that will lead to the most happiness, whatever that is, happiness, satisfaction, fulfillment, self-esteem, whatever your child is trying to achieve in life, balancing short-term and long-term goals, family, financial, and education needs to play a big part in it. Wealth is largely the result of habit. It takes as much energy to plan as it does to wish. A goal without a plan is just a dream. Lots of cliches, lots of quotes, but they're cliche because they're true and they matter. And the sooner you can begin planning, the more control you'll have in the future. You cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by avoiding it today. And so as soon as you begin thinking about college, begin making plans or exploring plans, right? It's an 18 year, might be an 18 year process. You're not always making actions within those 18 years. You're not always making decisions, just little decisions and making sure you're aware of it. Cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by avoiding it today. That's it for today. This week, we've got the two sessions, Loved Ones Off to College Today and uh, fast forwarding about 40 years to caring for adult dependents tomorrow. And then we'll take a break. Be back here in two weeks with changing careers, family and personal, family, financial and personal issues. Thanks for joining. I'm Brian Bolton, Brian Up in Louisiana. One of these days, I'm going to get these down to about 40 minutes. Today was not that day. Thanks for joining. Thanks for paying attention. I'm going to stop sharing. I am going to stop recording.